Hey all here, OS Reviews. Back in 2022, Unihertz came out with the TikTok. I thought it was a unique, rugged smartphone that had this secondary display on the back for showing notifications, acting as a viewfinder, and I liked the fact that they were trying something new. Well, later on, they came out with a light version of that phone, which was the Unihertz TikTok E, providing a much slimmer profile and also much more cost-effective. Today, we'll be taking a look at the third device in the TikTok family. It's known as the TikTok S, and this time around, it's much more of a next generation model of the more premium original TikTok because it is using the Dimensity 700 5G enabled chipset, which still remains a fairly powerful chip even now, and an updated display that's now using a hole punch for the 32 megapixel front facing camera as opposed to the teardrop notch found on both of the previous gen models, but still preserving that TikTok secondary display on the back. So taking a closer look at the phone in terms of specs first, aside from the Dimensity 700, this device packs in 8 gigabytes of RAM, 256 gigs of built-in storage, which is further expandable via micro SD card slot. There's a 5,200 milliamp hour capacity battery, which is still massive, although slightly smaller than the original model's 6,000 milliamp hour pack, but we are getting a much thinner profile that's more practical for daily carrying around. It has 30 watt for fast charging, so it can get topped up been around an hour and a half to two hours and it is running on Android 12. The other spec which has been upgraded would be the camera on the back which is now 64 megapixels for the primary lens compared to 48 on the previous two TikTok phones. I would still like them to have maybe a wide angle lens instead of a macro lens so that is one thing perhaps they could improve on in the future. There's also a dual tone LED flash. You can see the evolution there from being thickest, this one kind of in the middle, and then the E still being the thinnest by contrast since it has the weakest specs out of the three. The design is otherwise quite familiar, including a textured volume rocker that's easy to press. We also have the fingerprint scanner that dubs as a power key, very fast and responsive, some of the metal accents built into this very solid bumper, and I do have to say that in the hand, it definitely feels a lot more easy to manage with the 6.5 inch Full HD Plus 1080p display, still seems like a normal enough phone. Uh, the bottom though does have a flap that is protecting water from getting into the USB Type-C port. There is no wireless charging on this particular unit, but all in all, it still is pretty fully stacked. Uh, the two red accented keys on the left hand spine are similarly mapped as before, pre-programmed to open up the flashlight by default, but the beauty is both of these keys can be easily adjusted in the settings to open up other programs. The top also has a IR blaster, pretty rare to find these days, although there is no 3.5mm headphone jack any longer on this model. It has all of the standard built-in connectivity, including NFC for contactless mobile payment, GPS, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, IP68 for water resistance. So coming back now to the UI, overall it's a very stock version of Android 12, like most of the recent Unihertz phones that we have tested. So there is really no hints of bloatware aside from an extra toolbox and a sound recorder they have built on in. The toolbox I think also makes sense just because it is a rugged phone so you will be using it more outdoors, taking advantage of some of these sensors here including a level meter, a compass, as well as a decibel meter for measuring how loud your surroundings are, and even an underwater camera mode which will allow you to take images no longer using the touch screen but rather the shortcut keys to snap an image since the screen is going to be less responsive when you are underwater. Aside from that everything else is pretty much stock, just the regular Google Apps, including the Play Store, can be found on this phone, as well as the, even the notification shade and the newsfeed on the left hand side can all be found. That leaves the memory mostly unoccupied for you to install the applications that you actually want, plus you can further supplement it if it's not enough. And the settings here also is very clean. You get just a couple of customization options, including that secondary display. Controls are almost identical to before, where we're able to more easily customize the watch dial by cycling through different options that we see here on screen, like a smartwatch. The display here measures 1.3 inches diagonally, and the metal rim is slightly raised so that it protects the screen ever so slightly from getting damaged and overall I think it does look quite good when you place the phone face down you're at least able to still make out some basic things such as controlling music as well as simple notifications not nearly as advanced as something like the Samsung Galaxy Z Flip which has more of an Android like experience on here you have just a few preset widgets more or less including the compass and level tool plus you can use the camera there as a viewfinder which is one clever implementation that can be quite useful 
so that you can take higher resolution shots with a better quality primary lens. Now under the shortcut settings, you can also remap the aforementioned two function keys corresponding to what a short press, a long press, and a double press can trigger. When it comes to general system navigation, everything mostly flies. This is a processor that's on par with many of Qualcomm's Snapdragon 700 series chips, including the 750G for instance, also having 5G support. Uh, this one is also a 7 nanometer chip, so it's fairly energy efficient. Coupled to that large battery, it has no problems in terms of lasting upwards of two or even three days on a full charge. So pretty good in terms of performance. MediaTek has come a long way since the early 2010s, and now we are getting a performance as well as battery efficiency that is getting on par really with what uh, Qualcomm can deliver, and you are talking about a very good solution for a mid-tier phone. It has some different wallpapers that you can play around with, showing off the vividness of this IPS screen, which is one of the better quality displays in its price range when it comes to good viewing angles and overall quite nice saturation as well as brightness all seem to be satisfactory. Uh, if anything though, this display is still 60 hertz, so having a faster 90 hertz refresh rate would be nice, especially as more affordable phones are starting to have that functionality. So jumping into the camera interface, it still is quite basic, but in this case it at least gets the job done, and 64 megapixels is a lot of detail to zoom and crop into, even though it is using EIS as opposed to optical image stabilization. From the picture settings, you can then further move up the resolution. One thing that is missing here though would be something like an HDR, which I also think Unihurst really should add just to make their phones more competitive in that sense, even though by default the auto mode already tends to do a decent job, but having a setting there would be even better. At least there is a pro mode which allows you to adjust the ISO as well as the white balance more easily, and under more settings is where you'll find that macro lens uh, for really getting up close to your subjects. Now video quality here, you can also capture up to 2K resolution. Taking a look at some camera samples now, so this particular image as aforementioned is doing a decent enough job, even though there are different highlights as well as shadows, it's not crushing too much details, colors are not shabby at all, and the textures of the clouds are still preserved here in the background. Now this particular example is a comparison between the regular mode, which is capturing at, say, 30 megapixels, versus the full 64 megapixel image. So you can tell that the actual picture quality for the full resolution is really not bad. Uh, in fact, it's even a tad brighter in this example, and you do get plenty of again, details. You can zoom and crop all the way in, read these tiny text details on here compared to the equivalent shot from the regular 13 megapixels, which you can't zoom in as much and look a little bit more fuzzy by comparison. And there is no dedicated night mode on here. That's where this camera will struggle a little bit more, just like most entry-level and mid-tier smartphones. But all in all, Really not bad, I have to say, especially considering the price range and the details that you're able to achieve. Now, as we start playing back a sample clip here to test out the speakers, I will also mention that the keyboard, in terms of haptics, have also been improved compared to earlier devices. On here, it feels a lot more precise, and it actually is a pretty high-quality sensor. Alright, so some takeaways being that the speakers can get quite loud, although just like before, it is a single unit, so having a stereo pair would be, of course, even better, and it is placed on the rear, so it can get occasionally muffled up, but all in all, not bad. Display, again, is really good. It is offering saturated-looking colors, bright enough even if there's a bit of light hitting on it, as you can see, and a large enough screen size that it feels quite immersive, especially with that newer design for the hole punch, so definitely a bit of an improvement there. Now, the essentials of the phone are also handled quite well when it comes to making calls. Uh, 5G antenna here working decently with T-Mobile here in the US. Now jumping into a quick look here at web browsing, we can take a look at how it fares with opening up a complex page. You can tell that it's almost instantaneous. So again, the 700 series processor, even though it's not going to beat a Qualcomm 8 Gen 2, some of the true flagship grade chips, it will more than suffice when it comes to regular usage such as navigation, browsing the web. Now when we talk about gaming performance, that's where things are maybe a touch 
less impressive compared to, again, those aforementioned flagships, but you have to keep in mind the price here, which is very competitive, especially for a relatively novel phone that has a secondary display, and you can even install more complex games like PUBG or Asphalt, and they will definitely still run, although you will tend to lower the graphics a little bit to medium for a better experience, even though there's nothing from the Play Store that you can't install and play on this device. RAM management also seems to be quite fair, uh, with the 8 gigabytes being generous, I have to say, for this price range as well. So that is more or less it as far as our hands-on review of the Unihertz TikTok S. You may say that it's not quite as exciting maybe as the first model that came out because we have now seen this design from them. However, it is exciting in the sense that Unihertz has taken the best of their earlier phones, including a slightly slimmer build as well as a fast processor from the original uh, in a package now that is more cost-effective than ever. And it is a pretty compelling package if you're looking for a nice rugged phone that has a few extra sprinkled on top, a very clean UI, plenty of storage, and a pretty capable processor as long as you aren't expecting this to be a true gaming phone. So you can check out additional details if you are interested in the links down below, but for now that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews, that's been the TikTok S.